I will try to keep an eye on the questions during the presentation. And if I think there's a good opportunity to bring that question up during the presentation, I will. Otherwise, I'll allow about uh, 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the presentation for discussion. So before talking about the specific sectors of lodging and, and retail, I thought it would be helpful to just kind of step back and look at the idea of risk versus uncertainty. Because with all of the things that we've been experiencing since March, the, the best way to describe it is really, it's uncertain. We don't know what's gonna be around the next turn. So just broadly looking at the concept of risk, you think of it as a, a potential hazard that you would like to avoid. And for most investors, risk means the uncertainty of future outcomes. You know, you can also look at it as the probability of some adverse outcome. But with uncertainty, you know, the probabilities associated with what these outcomes might be, um, and even what those outcomes are, uh, are really not uh, very clear, not knowable. So this is not like the last one. This is not like the global financial crisis that we faced in 2008 and 2009. This is about stay at home, no travel, no air travel, no um, vacationing the way we saw before. Work from home. I have been staring at my webcam since the middle of March and that has become the interim norm for a lot of how business is done. And when you did want to go out to shop, only the essential businesses were open. So you're able to go to the grocery store, you were able to order food for pickup, you were able to go to the pharmacy, but there were very, very limited businesses that were open that you can go to. E-commerce exploded in terms of the way people shop, and that clearly affects the retail sector. The amount of shopping that was done things that you didn't traditionally buy online that you bought online as a result of having to stay home and having, having limited options when you went out, all those things uh, really are uh, shining the light on how different this one is. The idea of masks and hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer and even, even finding toilet paper. I mean, this is not what we've experienced before. And in the face of this, especially in the beginning of the buildup in March, when we watched TV, all we heard about were the models, the, the models for uh, infections, for growth, for the number of people that were uh, being hospitalized. All of these models were being created to try to predict what was going to happen. And as we look at coming out of this, the uncertainty in how we look at the future, the models and the scenarios that we look at going forward become uh, more critical, more challenging. So um, a recent Morgan Stanley research piece uh, laid out some economic scenarios in the face of this uncertainty. So if you look at these four quadrants, you have um, at the top, consumer risk aversion is low. At the bottom, consumer risk aversion is high. To the left, it takes longer for a vaccine. And to the right, it takes less time for the vaccine. So these, these four scenarios are some of the ways that we can look at what might we see coming out of this and how might we pre predict what the future is going to look like and over what period of time. So, you know, the base scenario, the new normal vaccine ha comes in, in the beginning of 2021, uh, but maybe we have a second wave in the fall of 2020. And um, this, is, uh, this is worse than scenario two, which is uh, just going back to normal. 
under scenario one, upper right hand side, we have the bull case. That is, the vaccine comes earlier than we expected. And with low risk aversion from consumers and businesses, we pop back quickly to the recovery that we're all hoping for. And then on the opposite side of that, scenario four, the bear case, the, the, the deep scars that this could leave us, that's um, recurring infections, that's uh, medium term disruptions with no vaccine in the near term, and then uh, a crisis of consumer confidence. So that really is the worst case scenario. But all of these are possible scenarios. The question is, what kind of weighting of probability do we assign to them? Before looking at the specific sectors, I want to speak briefly about the property indices. So this is based on the Green Street Commercial Property Index as of their report yesterday. And it shows you the, the index value. So with um, an index of 100, which we hit in 2006, we saw the impact of on value of the global financial crisis. And then we saw the recovery. And then we've seen a steady growth in the index up through the majority of the first quarter of 2020 before we see this uh, significant drop. And based on the Green Street numbers, we are down 11% um, from pre-COVID levels. When you look at individual property sectors, you can see that your um, with 100 being the baseline here, the lodging sector was acting pretty, pretty stable. And then in the first quarter of uh, 2020, we see the significant drop off. The other sector that I point out is the mall sector, which we've seen a steady decline in the property index over time, and then a quick drop that occurred in the first quarter. Just to give you a sense of where the CMBS markets have come um, since the beginning of the, uh, the pandemic and when it really started to affect the market, I pulled as of this morning the uh, CMBS non-current delinquency data for the conduit market, which is the multi-borrower transactions, as well as the um, single asset, single borrower, or large loan transactions. So when you look at the conduit universe, you could see that as of primarily the June payments, we had um, 2,025 loans for $38 billion, of which a significant portion of them were 30 and 60 days late. And that was a big difference from what we saw pre-COVID. Uh, the non-current numbers represent not only the ones, the loans that are 30 days delinquent or greater, but they also include loans that are considered to be in a grace period. They're not due yet, but they haven't been paid or less than 30 days. And when you look at the aggregate of all of those, we're at 3,000, over 3,000 loans with a total balance of $56.5 billion, which represented 14, a little over 14.5% of the total conduit universe. The large loan deals, we see 78 loans, $19.5 billion, or 12.5% of the single asset, single borrower universe that were uh, non-current as of the June numbers. Now, the July numbers are starting to affect uh, the single asset deals because they are generally due the first of the month, while the conduit loan uh, mortgage payments are generally due uh, more toward the second week of the month. But you see a significant increase. And again, here, when you look at 30 days and 60 days, that's when you're really seeing true delinquency. And we see that number increasing. Now, when you compare that to April, which is really the first month that you started to see uh, late payments occur. The total non-current loans were $42.5 billion. 
but a majority of them were less than a month. So at this point, we really don't know for how long people are not going to pay. You see the number of loans that are 30 days or 60 days delinquent, and it's significantly lower than what it was as of this morning with 16 and a half billion and 11.6 billion. So that significant increase, that's the alarming number. When you look at the single borrower, single asset loans and what the payment timeliness was in April, you can see that we did have $12.2 billion that were non-current. But when you compare it to the total delinquent loans that were 30 days late or greater, that was only a half a percent of the total outstanding. So most of it was coming from here. Again, I'll pop back to the prior one for a second. Now you could see nine, a little over 9 billion, 10 billion when you include 90 days. So these numbers really went up significantly where in April, there was nothing that was 30 or 60 days late. So those are significant uh, indicators of where some of the trends have been. So let's talk about hospitality first. This is a snapshot as of May based on STAR data. Now STAR data Smith Travel Report is a data source for the industry, for the hospitality industry, which looks at very granular property level, sector level data. And when you look at this chart, you see that the uh, year to date numbers on supply, there hasn't been a lot of supply that's been added. On the demand, there's been a significant decline in the demand year to date. Now, remember year to date also includes the first three months of the year, which were relatively strong up through the middle of March. When you look at the current month, you could see that demand was down 57%. And the REVPAR, the revenue per available room, which is an indicator that represents the product of the rate that you're getting and how many rooms were occupied in this past month, in the month of May, was down 71%. Year to date, it was down 42%. So that's a significant, significant decline in those numbers. When you look at the sector, and here is where we break out the type of change. So luxury, upper upscale, upscale, midscale, the various qualities of assets that you have. And when you look at them and look at the numbers of May of this year versus May of last year, you could see the significant change. So for the entire United States, revenue per available room, which again is the product of occupancy and rate, was down 71%. And when you further look at what subsectors faced the greatest challenge, it was the luxury and the luxury upscale and the upscale products. Those are the ones that are really the full service hotels with the restaurants and spas. And those are the ones that faced north of 75%, even close to 90% decrease in revenue per available room. And you could see that the economy scale, the less expensive ones were down 33%, still a significant number but it's starting to show you where the demand was coming from. A lot of that demand was being driven by the uh, healthcare workers and first responders who were starting to stay closer to their place of work, people that were traveling to be near family. So that economy sector, while down significantly, was still not as great as the luxury sectors. When you look at year to date, so, year to date, beginning of the year through May versus beginning of 2019 through May, we could see that the revenue per available room, the REF part is down 42% year over year. 
Now, again, that includes January, February, most of March, which was doing well this year, but it still shows you even year over year, a significant decline in this revenue per available room. So one of the things that you experience when the market is really trying to understand what direction it's going, how significant a correction might be. So you start really having limited transactions. So based on some research that uh, was put out by Baird, looking at some of the transactions that had occurred post COVID. And a lot of these had been in contract before and then either closed or price adjusted after as a result of COVID. So these four examples, we have uh, a 247 room hotel in Nashville and based on the estimates of this all cash transaction, we uh, Baird estimated about a 25 to 30 percent discount versus the pre-pandemic valuation. On um, in June, we had a 171 room hotel in Boynton Beach, Florida, which also included uh, 18 two bedroom townhouse rentals, and that had been in contract for 22 million dollars, and it sold for 19 million dollars. So a three million dollar um, decrease in price post-COVID. Uh, last two are pending, but both of them were in contract before and based on uh, the post-COVID investor uh, sentiment. This transaction in Nashville, smaller hotel, this was a um, unflagged hotel, had a discount of about 25% to the pre-pandemic valuation the last one was a full service hotel, 622 rooms, which had been under contract for $120 million pre pandemic and is now set to close at 80 million or a 20% discount. So we're starting to see some indications of the impact on value as of today. When you look at the hospitality REIT sector as it compares with the overall REIT sector. You can see that in 2019, the sector had a 15 and a half percent total return. That's uh, based on price, share price appreciation and income paid to the shareholders in the form of dividends. In June, it was down 5.3 percent from the prior month of May but year to date, it's down 48.65%. So a little less than half in terms of its value since the beginning of the year. And when you look at it compared to the other sectors and the overall REIT sector, it is a significantly higher number. So lastly, let's take a look at the CMBS data for the lodging sector. So one of the things about the CMBS market is the level of transparency available on the uh, deal performance. And as you saw from the charts before, the number of loans that are in their grace period, less than 30 days late, and then 30, 60, and 90 days late. So looking as of this morning on the uh, TREP data for conduit loans, which again are non, the, the, the smaller multi-borrower deals. So CMBS deals that contain more than one loan. Uh, for the extended stay product, there were six loans and these are out of the top 500 loans because there are 3000 loans in total that are non-current. The, uh, the six loans that were uh, extended stay product were uh, that were non-current, again, didn't pay, grace period less than 30 days, 30 days or greater, was about $400 million. On the full service hotel side, there were 103 loans that were outstanding that 
had a balance of $4.7 billion. And then limited service hotels and lodging, which is unclassified, and those typically were portfolios of loans that were mixed. You had $646 million and $1.07 billion, respectively, of loans that were not current. And those are in the conduit deals. You also have these single asset, single borrower deals, which are much larger transactions. And with those, the full service hotels, there were 23 loans that were non-current that had an outstanding balance of just under $4 billion and lodging unclassified, which again is portfolios. There were 23 loans with $5.6 billion non-current. So these are significant numbers. And as they move from 30 days to 60 days to 90 days, that's when you really start to see the impact and the potential losses that can affect the bondholders who are uh, debt providers to this sector of lodging. So now we're going to switch over and we're going to take a look at the retail sector. So retail has seen significant challenges, not just as a result of COVID, but also prior. And you'll see some data shortly. But one of the things that um, some people are aware of and some are quite surprised to see is the amount of retail space per capita that the United States has as compared to uh, other major countries around the world. When you look at this data as, as of 2018, when you look at the square footage of retail per person in the US compared to other countries, we have 23 and a half, and again, this is as of uh, 2018, 23 and a half percent, 23 and a half square feet per capita. The next closest is Canada with 16.8 square feet per capita, followed by Australia, 11.2. So Australia, the third highest square footage per person is less than half of the US. And then all of the other countries from the United Kingdom, uh, Japan, France, Germany, China, all the way through Indonesia, 4.6 square feet per person down to one square foot per person. The average for all of them was 5.5, uh, four five square feet. So clearly the United States is a multiple of the square footage that other countries have. And when you think about the impact of e-commerce and you think about the forced shopping via e-commerce that a lot of people globally were forced to take on as a result of stores not being open and a concern about not being able to go out or not being allowed to go out, that pressure is even greater with the number of square feet per person that we have in the United States. When you look at the REIT sector, you can see the, the breakout between shopping centers, regional malls, and freestanding. And this data, as of the end of the month of June, has total return for 2019, for the month of June and then year to date. So what you can see here in terms of the month of June is we've seen a significant increase month over month of return, but that's over a significantly lower number. So the number really to look at is the year to date numbers. So you could see that regional malls have uh, a total return year to date of 51 0.61%. So if you think of it as as of the end of the year, if you own the portfolio of retail regional mall REIT stocks, that was $100. And looked at the value of it today, on average, you would be about $49 for that same $100 investment if you purely invested in regional mall REITs. So that sector has really taken the greatest hit. And even on 
uh, in New York and on Long Island, I think they just announced that some malls were going to be able to open this week on Long Island. I only heard about two of them that met the qualifications and the requirements in order to reopen. But again, you compare the overall REIT sector versus the mall sector, the shopping center sector, you could see a significant multiple of decrease in return that the retail sector represents as compared to the total uh, sector for all rates. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the questions that was constantly coming up, and it was also the impetus for some of the stimulus that was put into place was providing business owners with the ability to borrow money so that they can in turn take that money and use it to pay employees to keep them on and also to pay their rent. So um, understanding how much of the rent was gonna be collected and what trends we saw ended up being an important factor in expectations for what the returns might look like. And when you look at <clears throat> the percent received during the month of April, you could see that industrial, multifamily, office, healthcare, all had pretty solid, not, not perfect, <clears throat> but pretty solid rent collections. When you look at retail, the freestanding retails had a 72% collection, while the shopping centers had a 45.9% collection. So less than half of the tenants in shopping centers paid their rent in April. When you look at May, you actually see a slight decline in both retail sectors and a little bit of an increase back in apartments, office, and healthcare. And then with the most current numbers, you see that industrial, apartments, office, healthcare, all pretty solid uh, collection percentages. The freestanding retail has gone up from 72% of rent collected to 79%. And the shopping center collections have gone from 45.5% or 45.9% up to 60%. Now 60% is still not gonna provide the owners of those properties enough rental income to pay the expenses that they need to pay and also be able to uh, pay their debt service, stay open, um, keep, um, keep the properties up and maintained. So, you know, the, the takeaway from this is that we're starting to see things moving in the right direction, but there's still a concern about retail, whether it be the square footage or even the number of uh, retailers that continue to shut their stores. <clears throat> so similarly, in looking at the stress in retail, in, in the lodging data, let's look at the stress in the retail data. So again, as of this morning, looking at the conduit loans, which are the multi-borrower deals, for anchored retail, which includes uh, shopping malls and other anchored centers, out of the top 500, there were 184 loans with an outstanding of balance of $12.1 billion that were non-current. As far as <clears throat> factory outlets, a smaller number of loans, smaller percentage of the total retail market, but they were, uh, the outstanding non-current was $314 million. And then other retail, which included single tenant and non-anchored was 13 loans, total balance of $660 million. So in, com in combination, you're talking about $13 billion of retail loans, conduit loans that were not current as of, um, as of last month. On the single asset, single borrower transaction side, these are the bigger deals. So in the anchored retail sector, you would see large shopping malls like um, the uh, Mall of America in Minneapolis, where that's part of the uh, single borrower anchored retail non-current loans. So there were 19 non-current loans with a balance of $5 billion. 
on the single tenant retail, these were typically portfolios. You had three loans with an outstanding balance of 846 million, and then four loans of other retail, $512 million. So what is this telling us about the retail sector? That there is significant concentration in particularly anchored retail, particularly shopping malls that have seen significant stress. And over time, those are the ones that are gonna be really facing the, the greatest challenge, potentially causing the greatest losses in, uh, in performance and in returns, whether you're a debt investor or an equity investor. So <clears throat> let's talk a little bit more about retail. Now, the chart earlier that I showed you that was the property price index showed that lodging had been relatively consistent through 2019 and only in the beginning of 2020 did we really see that significant decline in, uh, in valuation. For retail, the decline had been much more steady. That had already been occurring. Retail was already being challenged. And when you look at the performance and you look at the number of loans that were already challenged, delinquent, facing losses, the ones that had been on the books and of concern to investors had predominantly been retail loans. So retail had already been suffering in terms of the, uh, the dislocation, the, um, uh, the store closures, all of those things have been um, impacting retail for the last several years. So let's look at the um, percentage of retail loans that are in that grace period. Beyond that grace period, delinquent, which is 30 days or greater, in foreclosure or real estate owned, or special servicing versus other property types. So <clears throat> as of March, and in March, remember, people had paid their uh, rent the beginning of the month, investors had paid their debt service the beginning of the month, and things really didn't come to a head until the second week of March. So the loans that were in grace period were relatively low, and the loans that were delinquent were relatively low, and the loans that were in special servicing was only 1.83%, but 5.3% of the outstanding loans had been in special servicing. As soon as you get into April and May, you see the significant increase. So now you're seeing loans that are so April is the month where you're starting to see the impact, right? April is the first month that you now have to write a check as the borrower for your debt service. And many of your businesses, particularly if you're shopping centers and not uh, a grocery anchored shopping center, your income has basically plummeted because a lot of tenants were not open and not paying. And when you look at the increase in grace period, that's where you see a significant, um, more than threefold increase in the amount of loans that are in grace period. The loans that were in delinquency were actually just about the same. And then loans in special servicing, only a slight amount that had increased because some of the loans that had been delinquent before had moved over into special servicing. Now we look at May. May, the grace period, new loans that are now non-current increases further. That's telling, but even more telling is the significant increase in the number of loans that are now delinquent. So if you think about April, April's the first month that loans are really um, not paying a lot of their debt service. When that loan is still in the grace period or only 30 days late, 
it hasn't hit as a delinquent loan yet. As soon as you move to the next month, now you're 30 days late. And a lot of the loans that had been in the grace period now are delinquent. So that's why you see an increase from 3.6% to 10.14% of loans that are delinquent. So again, 30 days delinquent plus. Loans that are special servicing, those are the ones that have already been transferred over to special servicing. That has gone up another third from actually 50% from the prior month to almost 5%. And when we look at the June numbers, we don't see as many loans that have gone in grace period or beyond grace period, new additions to the late payments. You don't see that number increasing as much, but you do see more of the May numbers moving over into delinquency. So now we're at 18% of the loans that are delinquent, 7.7% .7 of the total of all assets. So that means that we are retail as of the June numbers, more than double the delinquency of all of the other asset types combined. And now we've gone up another 5% in special servicing. So now 14 percent of the outstanding retail loans that had been in trouble are in special servicing already. And this, this chart really more optically depicts how the trend was. And you could see retail was higher to begin with, higher level of delinquency. And as soon as we got into April, we see the spike in retail an increase in other, but the other is starting to flatten out and it didn't increase as much. So, you know, what are some of the causes of this, right? We talked about e-commerce. So the shift toward e-commerce, right, is not specifically tied to the effects of the pandemic. This shift had been occurring before. It exacerbated as part of the pandemic when people weren't able to go out, so they were shopping more online. But from 2014 to 2019, the percentage of goods that were bought globally online more than doubled to 13% from 6%. And now in 2020, especially during the pandemic, that number is only going up more. A couple of other interesting data points. Online grocery sales during the month jumped by 24% from April to $6.4 billion in May. So even though you were able to go to a grocery store to shop, the amount of online grocery shopping increased by 24% uh, month over month. Now, with hospitality, you're starting to see some improvement. People are going to start to travel. Businesses are going to start to reopen. People are going to start to stay in hotels again. How quickly the recovery occurs, that's a different question. But as far as retail is concerned, things are a little bit more pessimistic for the CMBS market. So $135 billion dollars of securitized loans, a quarter of the outstanding balance of CMBS is backed by retail. So, and in June, you have another 343 loans for an additional 9.4 billion that were added to the watch list. So that means they're at heightened risk of default. So let me just take a moment and talk about watch list for a second. The watch list, is when the servicers who watch the loans are seeing things that are where they want to point out to the investors you need to watch these loans they haven't defaulted yet they're not late yet but you need to watch them because the characteristics that they have the trends that they're indicating 
indicate that they're probably not going in the right direction. So $9.4 billion were added to that watch list and they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily part of the delinquency numbers. So all that's saying is we have this heightened level of risk associated with retail that is, seems to be continuing. Uh, one last point on the retail that I want to highlight. Every few days, you hear about another major retailer that has either filed bankruptcy or has announced store closures. Last week, Microsoft announced that they were closing all of their brick and mortar stores around the country. Now, I believe it was only 80 locations. So we're not talking about a huge percentage, but an announcement that they were closing all of their brick and mortar was a message that we think we can run our businesses and still be able to generate the kind of returns without having a store physically open and have people who shop our products be able to shop them online and maybe within other retailers. So that's just one example. The, this past week, I believe it was the day before yesterday, Brooks Brothers announced that they were filing bankruptcy and going to be closing a significant number of stores. Now they are located in a lot of malls. And when you think about the product that they have, it's not so much that it's something that you can order online and buy easily, but with the number of people that are working from home, you don't need the same number of suits of dress clothes for business if there's a possibility that you're not gonna be going back at least in the near term. And that short-term stress on a company like Brooks Brothers caused significant pain for them. We've seen it with Joseph A. Bank and Men's Warehouse, another uh, men's clothier that filed bankruptcy. J.C. Penney continues to announce store closures, which significantly affects shopping malls in particular. And being an anchor store, there are other issues when an anchor store closes that could affect the other inline stores within those malls that might have the ability to either uh, switch over to paying a percentage of their rent in, based on sales as opposed to rent because there aren't enough anchor stores pulling in the shoppers into the shopping center. So all of these things kind of point to a less than favorable prognosis for, for retail. So, you know, time for the grades. As far as lodging is concerned, I'd probably give it an incomplete and let's see what the performance is like going into the fall. We have states that started to reopen, but now we also have states that had been open that are starting to implement more strict guidelines. And if you travel to another state and then try to come back to, let's say, New York, there are certain restrictions around self-quarantine that is going to affect people's decisions to travel. So for lodging, like I said, we're going to give you an incomplete and we'll see how you do going into the fall before we decide what your, what your grade is going to look like for the year. Now, as far as retail is concerned, I'm giving you an incomplete still because there still is a lot of data out there that needs to be really truly analyzed. But as of now, unless there's a significant turnaround in how you're performing, I think you're probably working on an F for 2020. So I'm gonna stop now and let's see, there were a couple of questions, a couple of them re regarding um, circulating the slides. Um, I am gonna do that, uh, copies will be available. If you, uh, if you registered for the webinar, you'll be able to see that. So. Uh, let's see if anyone else has any questions that they'd like to ask. Um, you can um, you know, raise your hand or type it into the Q&A box.
Now I know someone's got a question. Okay, here we go. Is any of this data broken down by region, state, uh, or county? Um, so looking back at some of the information, particularly uh, the truck data, you can go back in if you're a subscriber to TREP and you can uh, take the loan data the, the 184 loans that were anchored retail in the conduits and look at those loans individually and then sort by location in order to determine um, what um, uh, where they are, the size of the property, a lot more detail. So that information is available. When, um, when you look at some of the um, government statistical data that's available, um, you can see that information about e-commerce, about um, retail sales is also available geographically. Um, and the government collects a lot of that data, especially using sales, uh, sales tax revenue. So there is, um, there's information available. Um, another question, um, have you seen or heard of plans to remodel these uh, mid-category hotels into residential or data centers? <clears throat> the, there are some hotels that are looking at alternative uses, but they're a little more limited in your ability to, uh, to convert them, probably easier for uh, for converting them to residential. I haven't heard about any organization looking at converting them to data centers. And I think probably one of the reasons is the, the infrastructure and power and, and uh, cabling necessary to create that data center structure and the cooling and the security, all those things would probably be more expensive to retrofit an existing building rather than to build something new. So I'm not sure you're gonna see that so much on data center side. On retail, more of a possibility to see repositioning of the assets when the malls just don't work anymore. Um, uh, at what point do you believe these delinquent retail loans um, face foreclosures and properties will start hitting the market at steep discounts? So when you look at the at the trends in terms of loans that are um, delinquent, so loans that are 30 days late this month coming, a lot of them are probably going to move to 60 days. Once you go to 60 days late, those loans will be transferred over to the special servicer. And the special servicer will have to get valuations done sometime between day 60 and day 120 to determine what the value of those properties are. The, the speed at which you will likely see them working their way through the process and start to um, show up as loans that are available for auction I, you'll probably see a little bit more distress start to show up toward the latter part of the year. But in terms of uh, wholesale loans and properties being put on the market to just um, sell them off at, at deep discounts, um, I wouldn't expect a significant increase until at the earliest sometime next year, because you don't, you also don't want to move um, and, by putting properties on the market at a deep discount, you start creating comparable pricing, which people will point to as market indicators for value. So I think it's going to be a while, but this is something that 
just given the difference in, you know, this time versus last, it's something you just need to continue to follow. Um, any thoughts on the business and financial health of the servicers? Um, good, good question. So for the servicers, uh, the, the loan servicers, uh, I'll, I'll break them out into two. So first the master servicers, which are the larger banks that are servicing the loans that we're talking about Wells Fargo, Key Bank, Midland PNC, those banks, I don't think we're going to see any uh, stress from the um, uh, CMBS market as a servicer. As far as the special servicers are concerned, this is the time when they get really busy. When a loan gets transferred over to special servicing, their fees start to increase. So I don't think you're going to see them facing a lot of stress. The, the bond buyers who bought the most subordinate bonds, that's a different story. They are probably going to be facing stress because they're the ones that might financially lose their position in these CMBS transactions. Um, are appraisers able to value these properties to get accurate pricing? You know, that's a, that's a good question. And last, uh, the last uh, faculty webinar that I did, we talked about valuation. And one of the things that continues to, uh, to happen is the lack of transactions are really only providing anecdotal information about where values might have moved. When you have trades that occurred, when you have investors with a little bit more consistency saying, here's where I think rents are going to go. Here's where I think occupancy levels are going to go. Here's where I think expenses are going to go. And here's the risk premium that I want to be paid in order for me to invest in that property. In order, before you can really have solid valuations, there needs to be a little bit more of a robust uh, market for sales activity. But right now, it's all really being tied to opinion. So it's very, very difficult um, challenge. And I started my career as an appraiser. I am very happy that my primary role is not writing appraisals right now. <clears throat> what do you think is the best new use of retail um, uh, above uh, multi-low-rise buildings in New York City? Um, uh, if future demand contracts for the retail footprint. Um, so just so that I'm clear, is the question about, you know, the, the Madison Avenue, uh, Fifth Avenue retail with uh, units above it? And what's the demand for that space? And um, if that's the case, then I think those um, high street challenges are going to be much more um, difficult, especially given the rent levels that they were uh, leased at, uh, until you have much more demand coming back. And if you think about those locations like the Fifth Avenues and the Madisons, a lot of that business is being driven by tourism. And until we have some consistent view of where tourism goes, it's going to be a lot more challenging to, to estimate how the use of that expensive ground floor retail is going to uh, uh, adapt. Um, uh, ironically, a lot of retail property owners had switched to experiential type of retailers as a buffer against online surge. Uh, is that going to blow up? Will gym, cinemas, uh, et cetera, be irreparably hurt? Um, well, I'm, I, I asked for questions and you're giving them to me and you're giving me good ones too, so thank you. Uh, the, that concept of experiential retail, if you think about where the trends were going, it was Let's have a place that people can come, they can hang out, they can experience the retail, um, the farm to table, kitchen, restaurants, come out and really enjoy this um, environment, the collegiality of everyone spending time together. And that is something that is at least near term 
has been significantly impacted by people's concern about going out and shopping. We, we are going to see over time, and maybe that goes to my point about, um, you know, um, incomplete, let's see how the rest of the year goes. Are we going to see people start to be more comfortable going back and shopping? What's the effect going to be on the restaurant sector? What's the effect going to be on um, the, the businesses in places like Manhattan where restaurants are paying significant dollars based on their ability to serve a certain number of meals per, per evening? And now they're barely able to open. And when you put the spacing in, they're not going to be able to afford to pay the same level of rent. So I, I think that that is, um, is definitely an interesting question. We've seen a couple of uh, gyms already filed bankruptcy. Gold's gym has already filed bankruptcy. So it's a good question regarding the, uh, the gyms. Luckily, I have some stuff in my garage, but I am looking forward to get back to the gym myself. Um, and uh, let me just answer one more question because we're out of time and I'll be happy to take questions after. Um, you can email them and I'm happy to take them. How might U.S. retail performance compare to recovery if any, uh, if any country, if in countries that lead the U.S. in COVID recovery, example, China? Uh, what learnings are available from places that are farther along than we are? Look, I, I, I think that one of the things that we're all looking at is how do we effectively turn things around? The fact that we had cities that had been open have to shut down again because of increased cases tells me that part of it has to be everyone cooperating so that we can get these numbers down. So. I think everything is on the table in terms of how we look at what other countries around the world are doing and being successful with versus what uh, is happening right now. So um, lastly, let me see if I can answer this quickly. Uh, do you think Walmart uh, rolling out uh, prime like subscription service will affect their long-term retail footprint? Um, also a good question, the Walmarts, that big box concept, were doing very well during this period over the last couple of months because they were allowed to be open and you can go there and pretty much buy everything. So the, the question I think is going to become, is that going to help them increase their uh, online capture? But more so, will they be taking away sales, not so much from uh, themselves by closing down and looking to push more into online, but what about the smaller businesses that maybe can't compete with Walmart on pricing? So if I can leave everyone with one thing regarding retail and lodging, these markets, these sectors have been hit significantly and everyone has an opinion about what tomorrow looks like. And sometimes when you look at it tomorrow, your opinion might change for the day after. So we look to continue to study the trends. What is the market doing? What is the market saying? Where is, where is the market putting its money? But more importantly, the consumers, what are they doing? Are they gonna travel and when? For how long, where are they gonna go? Are they gonna get on the planes again and when? And then as far as retail is concerned, if so many people got used to shopping online, how many of them are going to maintain that percentage of online shopping or some significant percentage of it, or are they going to revert back to where they were before? So on that note, I really want to thank everyone for your time today and for participating. The, um, this PowerPoint will be available. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure being part of the NYU faculty and keep monitoring these sectors and just the market in general. And um, I look forward to seeing you um, in person, hopefully soon.